Hola a todos, muy buenas tardes. Eh, yo soy Daniel García, el, el director de veterinaria y laboratorio de aquí del Oceanographic y antes de nada quería agradeceros a todos la, la asistencia esta tarde de domingo a esta presentación eh, para hablar un poquito de la importancia del desarrollo del conocimiento que se desarrolla con tiburones en cautividad para proyectos de conservación en, en medio natural y al revés, ¿no? ¿Qué podemos aprender con, trabajando con tiburones en medio natural para tratar mejor y conservar mejor los animales que tenemos en, en los acuarios? En ese sentido, bueno, pues hemos traído, hemos podido conseguir eh, que, que viniese una gran profesional y amiga, que es la doctora Natalie Milnichenko, eh, que es veterinaria de Disney, de Disney Animal Programs, y que trabaja en varios proyectos, eh, también en, tanto en el acuario como en, en, en medio natural. No solamente trabaja con tiburones, la que es una referencia, sino que también trabaja con primates, trabaja con diferentes enfermedades. Y, y bueno, para nosotros es una, una enorme posibilidad y oportunidad tenerla aquí. Eh, este workshop surge por, surge por iniciativa de, de tres personas, fundamentalmente Tania Monreal, de ICTVG, ICTVG International Zoo, Zoo Veterinary Group, que es una compañía inglesa que se encarga de la consultoría de parques zoológicos y, y acuarios, una veterinaria compañera y amiga desde hace ya muchos años, y Nuno Pereira, que es el, el veterinario del Oceanario de Lisboa, que es un eh, gran profesional y que, bueno, pues eh, de algún modo con el que también trabajamos muy estrechamente desde hace tiempo. En el mundo de los acuarios es fundamental el poder compartir la información y en ese sentido hay muy poquito escrito. Sabéis que hay un Elasmo Brand Husbandry Manual, un manual de descarga gratuita, de hecho, en Internet, sobre medicina y manejo de tiburones, pero considerábamos que era importante que todos los profesionales que nos dedicamos a la medicina de estos animales eh, nos reuniésemos en torno a una mesa y compartiésemos experiencias, ¿no? más allá de lo publicado, poder tener el feedback de compañeros de lo que ha ido bien y sobre todo lo que ha ido mal para, para seguir aprendiendo, proyectos eh, con animales en los acuarios, proyectos con animales en medio natural y en ese contexto entre Tania, Nuno y yo, pues montar una, una conferencia europea. Este es el primer workshop europeo que va, que va a ocurrir durante los próximos días aquí en el Oceanographic y, y por supuesto hemos invitado a otros ponentes que son referencia en, en su campo de medicina de tiburones. También quería agradecer al resto de, de ponentes del workshop la, la participación. Y ya que conseguíamos que Natalie viniese, pues queríamos aprovechar a abrir por lo menos la conferencia inaugural, que es esta, pues para que todos pudieseis disfrutar y, y aprender con ella. ¿no? O sea, me gustaría que, y tenemos un espacio para que después de, de esta charla, eh, pues podamos interactuar o podáis hacer preguntas. Ahora mismo, además de Natalie, aquí sentados hay eh, muchos profesionales de la, de la medicina de acuarios y de las mobranquios y creo que es una gran oportunidad para que los que hayáis venido podáis eh, resolver vuestras dudas o aprender o vuestras, vuestras inquietudes. ¿no? no quiero dejar de, de aprovechar que, este, que esta reunión se ha hecho en el, en el marco de eh, colaboración entre el, el Oceanographic de, de Valencia y concretamente su fundación, el Oceanario de Lisboa e International Zoo Veterinary Group como organizadores y, y sponsors de, de este congreso. Y bueno, pues sin, sin extenderme... Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, very quick for those English speakers that, but with the English speakers, most we we are going to spend uh, all the following days, <laughs> so <laughs> we will have to. But basically, yeah, I I want to acknowledge uh, the three main uh, organizing institutions: the Lisbon Aquarium International Shoe Veterinary Group and Oceanographic here in Valencia for giving us the opportunity to arrange this. A workshop uh, using the facilities and helping with uh, some of the of the covering some of the expenses and allowing us to to have such a, an interesting keynote speaker as Natalie Milnichenko as one of the reference specialists in elasmo rank medicine all over the world uh, and please the idea of this talk is uh, making it a little bit in interactive at the end so we'll have a running microphone uh, after Natalie's talk and I mean, for those of you that you are not going to stay for the whole workshop the following days, it would be great if you could uh, resolve your doubts or ask your questions, because right now in the audience we have a pretty nice group of experts in, in, in the field. So it's quite complicated to get some, uh, some critical people joining together in the same room, and it's always nice for those of you that are interested or are looking forward to ending up working in this field to to participate. 
and I don't want to extend too much uh, from now, so I'll just give a, a pass to uh, Dr. Natalie Milnichenko, Milnichenko, and hope you, you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I really welcome you, and I'm very glad you can all be here. So today, I'd like to talk to you guys about some of the revelations I've had through my career in terms of you know, how to be a really great veterinarian. And some of those things have been to just experience as many things as you can experience. I know we have a lot of students here, and that's wonderful. And hopefully afterwards, we can have a lot of communication about this so that we can share how we've done the things that we've done, talk about all these things. And really, this talk is about passion. It's about what people love to do and how they've been able to take all of their experiences to help themselves. So many of us are aquarium veterinarians and how we've taken experiences from other parts of our lives to help us become those amazing people that help treat all of these wonderful animals, both under the care of humans as well as in field conditions. So those are all of our wild animals. And so I just want to thank you guys again for coming here. I want to thank our committee members for inviting us here, all of our workshop members. And I'm sorry we can't all be together for the next three days, so I'll try not to refer too much to what we're going to be doing over the next three days, which will be like really detailed medicine of elasmobranchs. But hopefully in the future we can all see you guys again under those circumstances. So thank you again for coming here. So... Veterinary medicine is a very interesting thing. When you go to school, you learn to do really four basic animals. You work on dogs, cats, horses, cows, and those are things that we have to really get a good foundation on. We have to know how to manage those guys, treat them, how to know their diseases, but then how do you take that and translate it into something that's different? something that's a little bit more peculiar or in a very different environment, and how do you figure all of that out? And most of the time, when we're working with these animals, we're dealing with an owner or a family, so you know that animal's history really well. You have one person to talk to, and so on some levels, it's a little bit easier. But what happens when you start looking at all of those other creatures? Like, how do you do that? What, when your client base changes, when your client is no longer a pet owner and your client is someone who owns the aquarium or the keepers who take care of aquarium animals or zoo animals, and what about when that client becomes a, bi becomes a biologist, someone who has a PhD, who's working on wild animals, who owns those animals? You would argue that nobody owns those animals, but the biologists face a lot of responsibility for them because they're interacting with them. So your clients have changed, and that changes how you might interact with them or the things you need to know and how you might be able to help those people going through the process of your taking care of those patients, because they're patients to you as well. And so one of the things that, as I was reflecting on how to talk about this stuff to you guys, I was thinking about one of the things that first started a lot of my career choices. And when I was a zoo veterinarian working in Chicago, Illinois, the United States, I was asked by a biologist to come and help him with some fish. Now, these are experienced people. You know, these are people who do a lot of work. They place tags on the animals. They release the animals. They track them. They know a lot about what they're doing. But what they were facing was a situation where they were losing animals in the process of their normal day-to-day -day activities. And so they reached out to us to say, hey, I know you guys have some experience with aquatic animals and with veterinary medicine. We need some help. We'd like for you to help us evaluate what's happening. And these were with walleye fishes. So they're freshwater fish. It's a very large fishery in the United States. So commercial fishing as well as personal fishing, people who enjoy the sport of it. And so they asked us to come and help them. And so we came by and we were able to help looking at their situation. There was nothing they were doing wrong. It was just that there was a lot of factors to the situation that we were able to look at and go, how about this, how about this, how about this? And so when we were watching them, seeing their techniques, we were watching their anesthesia, we were looking at how they were doing their surgeries, we were looking at how they were recovering the animals, 
And we were able to help them with some minor techniques to help them with their survivorship, to help them with their animals. And so part of it was how they were doing their surgeries and how their water was. They would take water from the, where the animals came from, which makes a lot of sense, but it depends on the time of when they got those, that water sample. And it depended on how they were doing their anesthesia, whether they were providing enough oxygen, and sometimes their techniques for managing the surgeries. And so by being able to help them, we were able to get a lot of really great information as well. And so what we were able to do is learn from them how they tagged their animals. We were able to learn how the animal's natural history was, where they went, the importance of that project. And so by giving them techniques like what level of anesthesia to provide, to provide water over their gills to help them with oxygenation, give them pain relief, things like that, and then their recoveries, trying to keep the temperatures the same, give them oxygen. We were able to do some very simple modifications to improve their successes to almost 100% so that they had no more mortalities and they were able to continue with their studies. And so we were able to mutually benefit from that, and it was really an important experience for me to say, this, this is very important. This is a conservation opportunity and for us to look at what's happening in front of you. You know, a lot of people look at saving elephants or, you know, saving gorillas, saving great white sharks, where you might not have that opportunity. There's things going on in your backyard that you can do a lot with in terms of conservation. And it was very important for me to be part of that experience to go, hmm. Being a veterinarian is amazing, but being a veterinarian can make a bigger difference. Now, that's really amazing. So conservation. This isn't a conservation talk, per se, but conservation is an important thing. Conservation is very different to every person. When I started as a young veterinarian, conservation to me meant saving animals. I was going to save every animal. I didn't know how to do it, but I was going to do it. And it was you know, my, my passion at the time. But what I didn't understand at that moment was that I can't do conservation alone. I can't even do conservation with a bunch of veterinarians. I need to do conservation with the people that live in the area. I need to do conservation with people that understand the biology of those animals. I need to do conservation with governments. So it became a much bigger thing than I had ever imagined it would be. And it's not a daunting thing, it's just an understanding. And once you understand what you can do, you can really take a bite out of it and do a really good job. And so some of it is, you know, how do you help people help animals? You're not necessarily going to be the person that saves them, but you can help people save the animals. And that's really important. So those are, those are supposed to be circles there. So... <laughs> Over here, what this became, you guys may know something about the One Health model. The One Health model is something we're learning a lot about in veterinary medicine. It's not just us, you know, it's us, it's human medicine, it's the environment, and how those three things interact. And so in this particular circumstance, I've kind of modified it to veterinary medicine, field biologists, and then the people who matter in those circumstances, which are the fisheries. And those are the people who catch the animals, you know, who manage those fisheries. And so without those three overlapping, you can't possibly make a difference. And it's actually, to me, a little bit more complicated than even doing terrestrial conservation work. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, a little project I did this year, and I'll click on it in just a moment. Um, you guys should know that I normally get quite embarrassed about seeing myself on screen, so please forgive me. <laughs> but the reason I'm showing these little clips that I'm going to show you is because while, especially in this first one, you're going to see a lot of drama, it actually shows a really good message, um, good message and what it does is really show us how we have a lot of different people interacting to do some amazing things. Um, so this is a piece that came from Shark Week. It was called The Great Hammer Invasion. So a lot of drama, right? <laughs> the reason it's so dramatic is because it's trying to catch an audience that doesn't otherwise understand sharks very well, right? But it's an audience that really thinks of sharks in a predatory or ominous way. They want to get people involved. They want to get people interested. And this is people who aren't part of the veterinary trade. That said... 
Bimini is an amazing place for shark research. And so I'm going to show you a couple other videos as we go through so that you can understand some of the research that we did. And I'm going to unfold that story as we go along. So you're just going to have to wait. OK, so how does a veterinarian, oops. I didn't do that. <laughs> so how does, how does this veterinary medical profession fit into conservation? Conservation is a complex beast, and part of it has to be the health of the animals. But it's not just veterinarians. It's all veterinary professionals. Our field is very complicated. We have veterinarians. We have veterinary technicians or nurses that help us. We even have medical records people, as well as the staff that are in your hospital. All of these people have different skills. This is the important thing to remember, is the difference of skills and the difference of perspectives, which can bring everything together to you to make a project successful. And so at Disney, we actually involve all of our staff in conservation projects. So each person has the opportunity to go out and contribute, as well as benefit themselves from being able to do these programs. And it's really immensely important that you share all of those opportunities. So what I found super interesting when I was trying to prepare this, and just in like my day-to-day -day activities with people, I was trying to decide how I was going to define things. And so what are veterinarians? You know, are they researchers? Are they biologists? Are they, are they scientists? I actually had someone tell me the other day that I wasn't a scientist, and I was very offended by it. Like, what do you mean? I'm not a scientist. Of course I'm a scientist. Are we conservationists? I kind of thought they could be the same person, but the truth is that when you're talking about all of these people, you do have to start making some definitions. And for the sake of this talk, I'm going to be using field biologists as the term for the scientists who are out working with wildlife. Veterinarians are going to be the scientists who do medicine, with patience, and so that we can make sure we have those definitions clear. Although, do know that I think that they overlap, and I think that they have to overlap. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter, <laughs> and she's a budding young scientist. And when I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up, she wanted to be a veterinarian, researcher, biologist, scientist, conservationist, but only of girl animals. Only girls. <laughs> So how, would, how do veterinarians become part of this process? I think what's really interesting about projects, about um, different experiments, things of this nature, that there's a lot of ownership. Everybody owns something. And the reason that they own it is because they have passion. They love what they do. They love the topic. They love the animals. And so there's passion. And so that means there's a lot of ownership. But you also have to know that there's a lot of room for sharing, and without sharing, you can't do anything. And so when you're a veterinarian engaging with researchers, with field biologists, etc., you just have to recognize that everyone has their skills. In the first slide, I had circles originally overlapping. Everyone has amazing skills. They just overlap a little bit in some areas, but then you have to remember that there's all the rest of it. And there's a lot of perspective that you can gain from learning from all of these different people. And you have to remember that when you're talking to them, that you make suggestions. You don't tell them what to do, you give them opportunities. And I'll give you an example, and one of those is how they might handle the animals, or how they might perceive how a procedure should be done. You know it could be done differently you know it might be done better. Never think that way. It's just different. It's a different perspective, and they have been successful doing what they do, and you have been successful doing what you do. It's the overlap and the integration that's important. So it's just a matter of building those relationships so that you can have a successful project. And uh, this picture is on the beach in the Bahamas doing some examinations on some stingrays that live there. So, you know, why would you collaborate? You know, this talk is really about how the two things help each other, how doing captive animal care or managed animal care, we try to use that word managed animal care, 
in free range versus wild. You know, we want to be careful about our terminology. How do those two combine, and how are they important? And I will argue that I feel like I'm a better, better veterinarian because I could do both of them. And so you need to be able to combine those two things. And so everybody has their needs, everybody has their perspectives. From the perspective of the veterinarian, the number one thing is normal. And defining normal can be very difficult. So normal, you might say, is the free-range animal. They're not necessarily normal, but they're the closest thing you're going to get to what a baseline is. So, so what is regular for those animals? And so that's key. And then you can compare it to the things that you do. Natural history. You don't always know exactly how those animals are doing things how they're behaving, but when you talk to the biologists who work with them in the wild, you get a really great idea. You learn different techniques, and going back to that you know, example of how they do things differently, they're just different. They're not better, they're just different. And it's the perspective, I think, that's really important to see how different people think about the same things that you think about, but they just do things differently. And then honestly, you feel really good about helping, and so that's really important. So, what do they get out of it? You know, what they get out of it, again, it's a refining of what, what they already do potentially. So they may know how to draw blood, but you can help them draw blood successfully each time. You can give them different alternatives. You can give them suggestions for how to do things in a way that makes them more successful, get more data. Also, art alternate techniques. While they've been doing something for 10 years one way, you might be able to offer something that allows them to do it better, faster. Potentially, you know, and then we do medicine, we do exams, we do health, and so that's a really important piece of understanding what those animals are doing and how they're doing is to have that health survey for them. Uh, and other things, just to just look at kind of building on those, is handling techniques for us. We offer them the same thing. We have a different way of doing things because of our situation. We have an aquarium that might be finite, and you can, alter, you, know, you can give them alternatives for how you might handle them, and then you can learn from them how they, in an entire ocean, catch an animal, how they figure out where that animal is and the methodology by which they do it. So those are really important things. Things we bring to them are that we have perfected a lot of techniques because we can do it a lot. So we can do a lot of ultrasounds. We know exactly how to do them. We know how to help people. We know how to get the details out of those ultrasounds. You can stick a probe on something and say, there's a baby in there, but what more can you do? A veterinarian can potentially help you with that information. And anatomy is an interesting thing. They have a lot of basics about anatomy. You might have different perspectives on anatomy. And because you're doing ultrasounds maybe every day, you can help them and that can overlap and that can be really an amazing collaboration there. Innovation and technology is something we're always struggling with trying to make better. And so in this particular situation, it's a study where they're watching where the hammerheads go. Now these are animals that have an amazing migration all throughout the United States. They go down into the Bahamas and then come back up again. But nobody knows where they go, nobody knows what they do, and nobody knows anything about their reproductive patterns. In this situation, what Tristan wanted to do is know whether or not they're pregnant. And he wanted to be able to do that without touching them. This is the first time anybody's ever tried to do it. And so what we've been able to do here is take things we've learned from managed care. So training the animals, that's part of it. And these are wild animals, okay? So they're wild animals that are coming to a feeding station. We'll talk a little bit about ecotourism in a, in a second, but this is a diving industry, right? So people come feed these animals, they come to the area. And so he spent several days training wild animals to accept an ultrasound probe. And then we were able to communicate with an ultrasound company to try to figure out how we can make this machine submersible. It's waterproof, but it's not submersible. And so they took a lot of effort to try to figure out how to reduce the air spaces, how to fill it up, and try to make it functional so that we could take a small unit down under the water. And you could see that it worked for a little while. But the problem was the pressure. They were almost at an atmosphere of pressure, so it's about 33 feet. And so that started creating water leaks into the unit. Then it failed. We still got the ultrasound, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for us to figure out if that particular animal was pregnant. But it was a really important first step. 
And it was really important to point out multiple collaborations to try to make that particular moment successful. And so it was really an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, and this is just to highlight the company, just because they went out of their way to try to do it. This is the waterproof unit, and you can actually submerge it for a couple of feet. It just can't go to a full atmosphere of pressure where there's a lot of pressure on it. And so most of that is sealed up. But this, is, this company, actually, I cold called them. So I said, hey, I have this crazy idea. What do you think? And they're like, N no, mm, maybe. And so they started to work with us to try to figure out how to do it. And then they started to make modifications on this particular unit. And so mystery is still unsolved. We'll come back to it in a little bit. Okay, so how are these two scenarios different? Why does it matter so much for us to collaborate, to integrate really well? Well, and why we can help each other. That's always the thing. How do we help each other? So we have different kinds of access than the field biologists do. I have Buttercup, the stingray. I can see her every day. I can follow her. I can take her from when she's a baby to when she grows up. And I can tell you how that change happens. I can tell you all of the blood work changes she's gone through. I can't tell you what every ray of that nature has had as a normal. And that's where the benefit of the wild animal comes from, is that you can get multiple animals from the same species. So those two, you can easily see how they integrate. Um, and those, all of those are amazing learning opportunities for all of us to be able to do. And one of the things that the field biologists cannot do, although they try to do, is that things like reproductive cycles, where they can't, they can't get the same animal every day or every other day and monitor it and manage it, we can. And so we can work out those techniques, we can work out the assays, we can figure out all of those different hormones, and then we can apply it to those wild animals, those counterparts. So you can easily see where that integration happens. And then the truth is, is that fishing is fishing. So I've been on many an expedition where we either haven't gotten the species we want or we've gotten nothing because there's a cold front coming through. And so you're not always successful at catching the animals. Not that you are necessarily in managed care, but your likelihood is a little bit higher. So comparing this, I'm going to go off the path, just scooch. Aquarium medicine versus zoo medicine. They're similar. There's a lot of overlap, but they're also very different. And you'll find that zoo veterinarians and aquarium veterinarians are often two very different creatures. They have different groups. They have different conferences. They might have different ways of doing things. However, I will argue that the person who can do both is a very well-rounded veterinarian. If you can figure out how to anesthetize an elephant and then take a sand tiger shark and do that, that's pretty amazing. And it also allows you to have that integration some more. So you can do a little bit more, figure out how different places do things, different things, you know, how different people do things. That just makes you a stronger, more capable veterinarian. And I think those are really amazing, and the overlap is as powerful, potentially, as field biologists and veterinarians. And then I'm going to take it even further. If you've ever been a veterinarian that's worked in a third world country, it can be very challenging. You have limited resources. Sometimes you don't have water. Sometimes you don't have electricity. How can you be a veterinarian when you don't have all of your gadgets? How can you be a veterinarian when you don't have all of your solutions and all of the medications that you normally have available to you? And as veterinary medicine has gotten more complicated, you just learn more of the complicated things, and you stop learning some of those very basic things. And so going back and learning that very basic medicine, I think is really, really important. Sometimes all you can do is get your list of potential diseases and try to figure out how to make them fit without having all of the tools that you might have at your doorstep. And so it makes it harder. You know, how do you take, how do you do a fecal examination without all your chemicals? Well, if you understand the chemistry, you can do it. And so if you can do medicine in a third world country, you can figure it out. And it makes you a really competent veterinarian. So while I do a lot of sharks and rays, I also do work in Africa. And I think that that's been one of the most seminal experiences of my life because I came to a place where I had 
Occasionally electricity, sometimes water, and then I really had to figure out all of that stuff from the basics. Like, how do you centrifuge something without having power? You can use a hand crank, but you don't know that necessarily until you try it. And so it's been an amazing experience, but more so, it's been an experience in learning about people, their capacity, helping train, and then learning about them, learning about the animals. And it's been really an amazing opportunity. So this is a gorilla. This is an eastern lowland gorilla. It's the Grower's Gorilla. It's the only sanctuary of its kind in Congo. And so it's um, really an amazing opportunity. And it's completely run by the Congolese. Almost every other sanctuary, I'll argue, every sanctuary in Africa is probably run by someone who's not from that country. And so this is a unique facility in that regard. Now, what's interesting about it is that, you know, it's not, it's, it's a managed care facility, but the intention is to reintroduce these animals. But there are circumstances in which we can't necessarily reintroduce them, and so those animals are going to be under a modified situation, but they get to go out and be in the wild, which is fun. They have a 25-hectare area where they can be gorillas. It's natural, they can eat natural vegetation, but they have the choice to come in at night, and they are trained, which is also an interesting piece, and we can have some side discussions about that. But this gives an opportunity for these animals to be real wild animals and yet still have that management, that opportunity for care. And because of all of this, we're able to learn a lot. And so we're able to extend a lot of those things we've learned with gorillas under managed care and help these animals survive, and then vice versa. You know, we're able to take those lessons and bring them back and learn about them. But what's most important, this is why I bring this up, is because if you can do all of that, when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean, you can do anything. Because you can figure out how to do things. You can figure out how to do things without electricity. You can problem solve. You can know how to manage things. And you can figure out how to save things so that they're useful later. And those are really important things. So you get equipment malfunctions all the time. When you're in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone, it's a little bit harder. And so that's why I bring that up, because it helps you with your integrative medicine. Um, this is one of my colleagues, Dr. Julie Cavan. She's doing some field work right now, working with some black tip reef sharks. And so you can see she's like on the side of the boat trying to figure out how to work these machines and you know, get those samples. And so she's taking all of her experience that she's learned as a veterinarian working in an aquarium, and she's applying it to be able to work with free-range animals for the benefit of those animals in the aquarium, but also for health surveys of the animals in the wild. So this is, that was the funniest moment when my father saw that and realized what I actually did for a living. 15 years of being a veterinarian, that was the first time he's like, do you do that a lot? <laughs> I don't do that a lot, but I do things like that a lot, which is kind of fun. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to whether or not she was pregnant in a moment. How are we doing on time? How much? Oh, we're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd throw in a couple of other things of, you know, how how conservation works, how a bunch of people can get together and do amazing things. And the Elephants and Bees Project is one of those things. It actually has very little to do with veterinarians, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this is an opportunity where the folks in the field, in field work, came to a managed care situation and said, we need your help. And so they actually asked us for help in managing their elephant populations and keeping the elephants from going into farms. It's a huge issue. The animals are endangered, but they're destroying farms. And so when you're destroying the livelihoods of people, it's hard for those people to care about those animals to make them want to live, survive, and help them survive. And so a very simple process happened. We had our research go researchers go evaluate the situation, and they realized that the animals that were recognizing that there were killer bees around made different sounds. And so we had our sound experts go out to our animals, record normal, expose them to the sound of bees, and hear their response. And our animals made an alarm call against those bees. We have bees in Florida. That's where I'm from. 
We don't have killer bees, but we have Florida bees, which hurt enough. <laughs> and they created this alarm sound. And they were able to take that alarm sound and had a motion trigger at those farms. And so whenever an elephant came close to the farms, they would have that alarm call go off, and the elephants wouldn't come near. It was a very simple solution. But it was a very important solution because then those people were able to save their food source. And it was just by means of having this kind of collaboration. I thought that was kind of a fun project to talk about. Okay. So how are other ways we kind of help each other? I didn't want to make this a veterinary focus talk, but I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> it's what I do. And so some of the things that I think we particularly do well are that we can take these animals, because we see them all the time, we have the opportunity. We can perfect handling techniques. We can perfect anesthesia techniques techniques for pain control, things like that. We know exactly what diseases look like, how they manifest, how we can manage them, what an epidemiological outbreak looks like. We can help them with understanding how that disease works to help them with prevention. And then quite honestly, if we can get a passion for it, if we have the opportunity and the interest in it, we can potentially find some funding opportunities to help continue those projects and to help insert ourselves and you know, work towards those, the goals of those projects so that everybody has a mutually beneficial outcome. Um, some of the other things which are, you know, might, might seem like, oh yeah, of course, but it's true. We learn things like, they don't do a lot of semen collection in the wild. I'm going to show you some pictures in a little bit, but we've been doing that. We've been trying to do some semen collection and understand how we can preserve sperm so that we could potentially use that for our managed care animals and to have sustainable populations. So, th so those are really important things. We can figure out how to take samples, and instead of using very large sizes, we can minimize it. We can take little birds and do stress hormones on them and figure out how to make that happen. You can see how that can apply really well to a situation where they have very small animals that they want to get information from. And so that's helpful as well. And education opportunities. We have a lot of situations in which our zoos and aquariums have a lot of education groups, and they're built, they're designed to help with education opportunities and to spread the word. And so you can utilize those resources as well for those field biology opportunities. Capacity building, that's what we like to use the word for when we're trying to teach people in their scenarios how to be able to do those things, how to get funding, how to do those diagnostics. And so this is at the Bimini Shark Lab where I gave a lot of lectures on ultrasound basics. How do you do an ultrasound? What does it mean? How can you collect samples in a different way? And so it was really an amazing opportunity to help each other. So I was able to get my samples and get my baselines, and they were able to then get a lot of information back, which helped them. And that's the key in trying to do, in building these relationships. Quite honestly, basic science, one of the things I'm struggling with right now as I'm trying to find funding opportunities is that one of the criticisms is, this is basic research. You know, why should we fund this? How is this conservation? It's like, because every other conservation project has already done the basic research. In the aquatic animal industry, we don't know a lot. And so it's really important to start with getting those foundations. And then from that, you can build up into doing these amazing projects. They're already amazing, but when you're trying to get money, people really want amazing. And that's why you see a lot of the drama that you see in the, you know, the videos that I'm showing you. And so ultimately, you know, why do we do any of it? You know, we do it because we care about the animals we work with. They are our patients, they have names, they're animals we manage and follow. And so it's obvious that those are animals that we have a very strong bond with. But free-ranging animals, it has so many implications, not just for the individuals, for the entire population, and for the environment itself. And so that's why we do it, because it's really important. And so some of it, some of this is just repeats, right? It's for preserving the species where they're at. It's for understanding how they function in that area. It's for educating people to make them care about the animals. You can't do conservation if people don't care about the animals. 
And it's just making sure the populations are healthy to be able to do that. And then if you need to, to be able to take animals, put them back into the wild, or move them from one place maybe to a safer place or to a better habitat. And those are all important things that we could do as a collaboration. So what they further did in this documentary is to try to follow their migration path, and they followed them back up into Florida, where there are huge migrations of black tips. And they found that they were actually also predating on them in the very latter half of gestation. They still don't know where they pup, though. So the mysteries continue. But they have this amazing migration pattern going from North Carolina down to the Bahamas and then back up again. And so they're going to figure out more and more what's happening. But why is this important? Why, why is any of this important, right? And so um, a lot of it's important because of knowing when and how they're being fished. And so you can change the rules for when they're being fished so that you're not getting them when they're pupping, so you're not in those areas where the pups are going to be. And in this particular instance, what's interesting about it, and we can argue about ecotourism, positives or negatives, but what you've got here is a situation where you've got one of the top 10 predators and you've got people diving with them, people three to five feet away from them watching them, caring about them, looking at them in a very different way than they've ever looked at them before. And so from that aspect, it's a very successful journey for them. And so it kind of changes how their outlook on these animals. Right or wrong? <laughs> whole different a whole different talk. So um, I have a bunch of photos and such. Are we good on photos? We're good? We're good. Okay. Um, so... We're just going to kind of go through some of the different ways that veterinarians can apply what they've done under a managed care situation and how they can apply it to the free-ranging situation. And so we have here, Dr. Danielle gave me some photos, and um, this is kind of an interesting one, which I thought was, a, it's actually a fantastic story. So what we have is a lot of human activities causing a lot of problems with wildlife. We hear a lot of it with marine mammals. But you don't hear about it nearly as much as you do with the, I mean, the fishing industry has a lot of collateral damage that can potentially happen. So in this situation, they had a wild animal that had some hook entanglement. And so they sent out their team to go capture the animal. And because of their abilities to know how to manage that, they were able to go in, get the animal, remove the hook safely, and then be able to save that animal's life. So it's a pretty cool story of being able to take a wild situation and adapt what you've learned in order to help that particular animal's life story. Uh, we've got other things. Something so simple as looking at a dead animal is so important. For you to be able to take an animal, so this is Dr. Julie Cavan again from the South Carolina Aquarium, she was called out for this blue shark, and so she was able to go there, take the opportunity, and learn from it. It was actually alive when she called, and so she still had hopes that maybe she might be able to do something, but by the time she arrived, it had passed away. She didn't let that opportunity go. Never let an opportunity go, even if it inconveniences you a little bit. Um, O-Search. You guys have heard of O-Search? Some of you, maybe? It's, an, an, it's a very big opportunity. They've created this boat that allows them to go out and catch very large sharks. So they focus on great white sharks, they focus on tiger sharks, and then sometimes sand tiger sharks. And they're an amazing research vessel, essentially. But they take people from multiple disciplines and try to make them into this one huge collaborative effort. And I'm going to show you just some pictures of how they do that. They have this side device and the device allows them to go into the water, bring the animal up on the deck. So great white sharks are very large. They're able to bring it up on deck, lift it up, manage the animal, get their samples from it, tag it, and then release it. And that was one of the important things with the hammerheads, is that while they did really do a lot of drama with, oh, they're going to catch the shark, the reason they catch the sharks is so they can put transmitters in them so they can track them. And so that's one of the most important pieces of that puzzle. And that's what they do here, is they're able to track the animals, and then you can go online and watch where those animals go. And so they can identify all of their habitats, what happens with them, and what they do. 
And they have a team of scientists that go and help them. So now this is that deck before it's gone into the water. This is one of the sharks on that deck. Um, we have a collaborative with a group that does reproduction. It's the Southeastern Zoological Alliance. And they actually do a lot of work with animals in the wild as well as managed care. And they do a significant amount of overlap. And so in this situation, they're ultrasounding a tiger shark to see if she's pregnant. It's kind of the same thing. You want to know if they're pregnant, where they're at in their pregnancy, so you can identify the areas in which they go so that you can help protect them during those vulnerable times. Dr. Mike Hyatt at Adventure Aquarium in the United States, he's actually one of their lead scientists, and he does a lot of the sampling for the animals. And this is just what the collaboration looks like. This is how many people it takes to work on a great white shark. Okay, some of the other things that we do, there's an entire sand tiger reproduction initiative. There's actually two of them. There's one going on in the United States and outside of the United States, each of them doing slightly different things, but they overlap. And so those collaborations are probably going to start coming together a little bit more. But in the United States, we have multiple aquariums that are interested. This is a species that they keep a lot. We have, I don't even know how many you have here, a lot, <laughs> but they don't breed well. Why don't they breed well? So we need to find out why they don't breed well. And so they look at animals both in the wild as well as under managed care, and they do a lot of amazing things. So they actually do semen collection. This is a picture of Dr. Robert George from the Ripley's Aquariums, and so he's actually taking a semen sample right now, and he's going to take that semen sample. I'm going to show you a picture where he's going to rush to the shore and put it into one of his females. <laughs> and so he's doing that. And part of that is to help broaden the diversity of genes. Part of it is these are big animals. So for you to move these animals around to try to get them to breed is not a really easy possibility. It's hard to transport large sharks successfully. And so the, you know, the biggest motivation for this is to have sustainable populations. And once we figure out how to do it with these guys, we'll be able to figure out how to do it with other ones. And there have been some successful artificial insemination techniques, but not with the live bearers yet. They're working on it. And so they're taking ultrasounds, they're taking blood samples, doing reproductive hormones, and then they're going to be trying this as a much larger initiative. The problem right now is we can't take sperm from a shark and keep it alive for very long. And we can't figure out ways yet, though they're working on it, how to keep it frozen so we can use it later. And so that's a very key piece. These are just some pictures of ultrasound and question marks. <laughs> what does that mean? I have no idea. So part of it is the puzzle solving. Uh, this is actually Dr. George sticking a camera into the uterus of this sand tiger shark. She's actually an animal that is not reproducing, and part of it is because she continues to keep yolks in her uterine horns, and so they're trying to figure out what her particular issues are. Georgia Aquarium is part of this process. That's, that's what it looks like when you work on a shark. You have everybody over it, so you never get good pictures. And this is the insemination of a female from wild semen. They were not successful. I know you're all thinking that. Um, so we're going to apply similar techniques to trying to figure out how to do this with sawfish, because it's the same situation. We don't know normal. We don't know what they do, how they do it, where they do it, and when. And so part of this process is trying to figure that out and apply all the same techniques. It's just they're further along with sand tigers than they are with the sawfish. It's not just sharks and rays. You know, we are expanding our talents. We talked a lot about some of the other species we do, but we do a lot of sea turtle work too. There are lots of other species that we try to deal with in the aquatic habitat. And I've intentionally stayed away from marine mammals today, but you can see here that we're working on a sea turtle and how we take all of that knowledge we've learned working with our managed care animals to getting these guys healthy again so that they could be released. And it's probably one of our most successful global initiatives is being able to get sea turtles back out. 
just some additional photographs, um, pathology on the bottom, taking animals that have passed away and learning as much as we can about them. And then just the, the realities of our world. We've recently had greater than 2,000, which means there's probably a lot more animals coming up on the shores of California, just leopard sharks dying. And because there was a big initiative to try to figure out why, we've been able to get a diagnosis. The real question is, why now? and why this particular organism. So it's given us a lot more questions, but we have an answer that gives us a possibility for a solution, which is really amazing. And this is just a fun one. This came up like a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is an animal, a bull shark, that they caught in the wild. And she's a mature female. And she has a back problem. You guys see that, the curve? But it's clear that it's been going on for a long time. It's also clear, you see how chubby she is? She's doing just fine in the wild. But they had no idea, they had never seen it. So they called me and they said, have you ever seen this? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have. <laughs> and so I was able to tell them some of the possibilities and why that might be for this particular animal. And they released her, they tagged her, so they'll be able to follow her long term and see how well she actually does with this particular deformity. And so it really comes back to, you know, why do all of this? Why do all of this with the wild animals? And it goes back to conservation and what it means to you. It's really about trying to figure out how to save those populations, how to help fisheries understand when things are happening so that you can help provide feedback for them to help them have sustainable populations, which is truly important. More of the same. So generally, the themes of today are really just being able to come up with notions of how you can have this crossover, this integration, and being able to figure out how to make sure that all of these animals are doing well under your care, whether it's under the world's care or whether under managed care with us. And so we just try to do the best that we can. So the take-home points... You know, we have amazing techniques that we've developed that we can share across all of our different um, venues and all of the things that we do. It helps us improve the animals, uh, understanding of the animals so we can manage them better in both situations. We get a lot of basic information on them. Knowledge is really power in all of these situations. Um, these are just some really quick things, how to help species. So Reverse the Decline is an initiative that Disney has particularly taken on. 10 years, 10 species, $10 million. One of those groups of animals are sharks and rays, and so they're committed to helping put a lot of resources into trying to save species. And so it's a huge undertaking. We're doing this with a lot of different institutions to try to help preserve all of these species. And it's a, an amazing global initiative. And then um, for those of you that aren't familiar, in, in the United States, we have the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And it's a very large organization that helps manage the zoos and aquariums. And they've created these programs, kind of the same as the Reverse the Decline one I was just telling you guys about, where we can actually make these big concerted efforts to try to help species. So in terms of governments, in terms of rules, in terms of how we manage them, research, pulling all the data together so everybody can share it, and so that we can then add that to all of our conservation initiatives. And so they're pretty amazing programs. And those are just the two I've highlighted. There are so many possibilities. These are just some of the biggest initiatives. And so it's just a good reminder for why collaborations are important and why your expertise can be one of those really fundamental things that can help those populations in the future. So think about it. Conservation, veterinary medicine, you can do it. That's it. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, is Anastasia something we miss in free range in sharks until now? Or because uh, <laughs> this film a little bit reminds me on the John Wayne Hatari Completely. 40 years ago, where we yeah. caught giraffes with ropes and things like that. <laughs> yeah. You remember when I was saying there's a lot of differences in opinions and perspectives. Yeah, a lot of the field biologists 
very, very firmly believe that you should not use anesthesia. They believe that if you use anesthesia, that will make the animals compromised for release, and particularly in a situation like this, when you, risk, when you weigh the risk of handling the animal for a certain amount of time versus not, they prefer that. I think the veterinarians prefer anesthesia of some kind, but the challenge really is the recovery part of it. If you can guarantee a fast induction and a rapid recovery, I think most people would be amenable to it. But we haven't been able to find something that's like that, that would be effective enough. Um, the other thing of concern is analgesia and whether or not, you know, where, where does that hold a place in terms of some of these aspects? And so like lidocaine locally, things like that. So um, that's one of those big discussion points that need to be a continued Factor. I completely agree. It was surprising to me too. <laughs> ah, okay. The right thing. Okay. More questions? Which way? Oh. I should stand out of the light. No, it's everywhere. Hi, I'm a wet student as well. I want you to ask, like, when you're in the wild and you need to anesthetize, like, a wild shark or something, how do you just um, know their size and weight and ca calculate the anesthesia mm. and stuff like that? It's just... It's, cause <laughs> this we, is no different than being at the zoo. <laughs> yeah, because when we did it in our mm -hmm. second year, we had to know the weight and the size, and then we know the particular anesthesia we need for a dog, for example, mm -hmm. and over here you're in the wild and you just see the shark and you're like, okay. <laughs> so if, if you are allowed to do anesthesia, yeah. so this is the part of it, um, there's two aspects. One is if the animal is a food animal, then you're not allowed to. So in some countries, you know, it depends oh, on your okay. country and oh. it depends on their rules. And so you may not have that option. Okay. However, under different circumstances, like if I could take an animal and keep it for a little bit and then release it, you might make different choices for anesthesia. If you're putting them in water that has anesthesia, there's no bearing on weight. So you have different ways to make them calm? And yeah, and, and a lot of people use tonic immobility where you can flip oh. them and they actually calm down. The hammerhead sharks, yeah. the great hammerheads, usually only have like a two-minute tonic immobility. This animal had like 20 seconds of tonic immobility before okay. she broke free of it, yeah. Okay. If we're using injectable drugs, mm -hmm. I'll tell you in my circumstances, maybe these guys have some more comments, sometimes if you don't touch the animal for three years and it's grown, you just have to do your best at guessing. But as you're a veterinarian for longer, you'll start understanding your ranges okay. so that you're able to then kind of guess where you need to yeah, be. Yeah, like even for antibiotics and stuff like that? Like oh. It's such a, <laughs> you should stay for the for the rest of the workshop. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like so curious, like how do you? So my question to you is, when you have no studies done in a species, how do you even know where to start? Yeah. Like... So do I go with five milligrams per kilogram or twenty five? Just... Yeah. This is what we face every day, whether it's a shark yeah. or an elephant or yeah. you know, a bird. We don't always know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to use your best guess for either the dose yeah. or the weight of the animal. And actually, some of us get pretty good at it, or at least your keepers get really good. So like, are you at that point where you see it and you're like, OK, this much we need? Oh, okay. For sure, okay. yeah, right? <laughs> you kind of, yeah, you figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's a great question, though. <laughs> Hi, uh, I want to know if you see the two-minute tonic immobility in all of the Hummer sharks or only in the young ones? I think tonic immobility is a very interesting topic to discuss, and it could be a very it could be a lecture on its own. And so I think that a lot of the Svirnins probably have a variable time, but they're probably not very long, versus you have something like a lemon shark where you can get an hour maybe out of it. But I've never had good tonic immobility for a very long time. And some of the smaller Svirnins, because they're so delicate, I, don't, I usually anesthetize them. But I think we've got our other folks that have done a lot of TI with hammerheads. Maybe you guys can comment. No, we, we, we typically don't use that much tonic immobility even in the bonnet heads or in a spirnida, mm -hmm. and we have never accessed the, the really large ones, so I, I don't have yeah. the... 
good experience with that. We typically go to anesthesia too. Yeah, yeah. and I, these, these guys, the, Bim, the Bimini folks, they really only have the graders, but they swear they won't get more than two minutes out of it. So most of it's manual restraint. And most of the hammerheads, you'll see that they, they'll be hook and line caught, but they're on for a long time before they could bring them up. And they actually have high mortality rates, which is where they've developed that 15 minute time frame. And they've had all of their animals survive, and they know they've survived because they've tagged them. And so, but they won't go beyond it. I mean, they are so serious. They're like, 14 minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. What is really remarkable is that it's very species specific, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some elasmobranchs that tonic immobility is really useful mm -hmm. and lasts very long, while in some other species it, it really doesn't, doesn't work. So. Absolutely. And I think my biggest issue is that you need to know you're actually in TI versus manually restraining the animal. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. <laughs> Um, you mentioned before how it was pretty difficult to get uh, proper funding for basic research in conservation. And I just wanted to ask, who's founding this research? Oh, that's a very good question. There are, there are a number of different organizations, some which are very focused on sharks, others that are just focused on animal veterinary research. So that would be like clinically applied research. And so a lot of it is just finding out those different funding institutions, how much do they give, et cetera. There's like Save Our Seas. And I, the, Disney has a conservation fund that they do where they can do, you know, depending on what project you have, they'll fund you potentially for the whole of the project or parts of the project. Uh, a number of, the, of aquariums will do small funds and so if you're looking at doing a, a student project, for instance, sometimes there are funds just available for students to do small projects. It depends on the scale, I think, of what you're trying to accomplish. All right. <laughs> Hi, Natalie. I, I would like to ask you, what would be, from your point of view, your personal point of view, the main role of a public aquarium in elasmo run conservation? Is more like creating awareness or teaching the people or putting funding or developing research or a little bit of everything, but which, which would be for, I mean, which is the role that we should yeah. somehow develop for being a modern aquarium and promote conservation of these guys? I think it has to be a little bit of everything. However, you have to have people care about the animals. And if people don't care about the animals, they're not going to care about conserving them or funding them. And so I think having that... Awareness part. That, that awareness, that bond. And that's why, you know, no matter how everybody feels about touch tanks or interactions or things like that, those are the things that make people really care, is having that opportunity, that one-on-one -on -one to say, oh, you know, I've been with this animal. I know about it. Yeah, it means something to yeah. me. I change a bit the story of a dolphin as the good guy, the shark as the bad guy. <laughs> you know, that it's a kind of I don't know if Disney has a little, a little bit to to yeah, mean, mean with this thing, no? But well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't joking. have anything to do with that part of the company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. But but really, I think it's uh, I think it's great that you mentioned about the um, uh, ecotourism part. Mm -hmm. That I think some somehow we can. We have to learn how to present the animal some other way to the people because at the end it's society, the one putting the money, putting the resources mm -hmm. and respecting or polluting the environment. So it's, uh, I think it's critical. And the other question would be for the people that right now is studying and somehow want to be more involved with species conservation as you are working not just with sharks but also with primates in Africa and mm -hmm. several other species and conservation programs, would you be, I mean, what would be your advice for those guys, I mean, young guys that really want to end up being a wildlife veterinarians or biologists that actually actively involved in conservation? What would be the, the skills you will consider critical or the route that they should follow in order to end up being good professionals of that field? Yeah, that's a good question too. I used to have like a list of things you should do, like take this course or do this or do that. <laughs> but the truth is, it's about it's about sacrifice. 
It's about sacrificing your time. It's about going to do those necropsies on the beach with someone that works in that field, letting them see that you care. Doing the work is really important. Being active, being present, and showing a continued demonstrated interest. Then you'll be known. You need, you know, then, you'll, then people will know what your interests are, your passions, and that you're competent and capable. And I think that's most important. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes.